Welcome back, friends. Today I wanted to do a video on baptism again. Is there salvation in baptism? So, the short answer is yes. And I'm going to start that by going to 1 Peter 3.21. By the way, what I did here is I had a friend of mine tell me that he thought we should try to spend... He thought I should slow down on the Bible verses so that he could follow along. And so now I'm not using my uh, app on my phone today. I'm using just the Bible itself. So I'll be turning with you if you're going to the Bible verse. So it's 1 Peter 3.21. Um, to that, that should help us to slow down a little bit. And you can follow along in your own Bible. Read with us. So... First Peter 3.21 says, The like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we see here that Peter himself thought there was salvation in baptism. Again, I'm going to read that first verse, or the first part of that verse. The like figure, he's speaking about Moses, or I'm sorry, Noah, being raised up by water, being saved in the ark by water when everybody else died in the water. And yet, Noah was saved. The like figure, whereunto even baptism, doth also now save us. So again, Peter thought we were saved in baptism. And Paul did also. He thought in Titus 3, 5, I believe it is. I, I, I didn't. I've got to find these. And you'll have to bear with me. But this is the idea is that you also would follow along. So Titus 3, 5 is going to say much the same thing. And perhaps I'll read four. Maybe I'll read a few verses here, at least four through six. But after that, the, this is Titus 3, 4 through 6. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Okay, there's a couple of points here that I want to bring in because this helps to explain what is baptism and why did I use these verses. Now, I'm not a Greek scholar, but I, I listen to Greek scholars. And uh, so this, in the original language, leaves no doubt that the washing of regeneration is a ceremonial washing which can only mean baptism. Now, this is not me. I, I can't read Greek. I don't understand it at all. Nevertheless, others tell me that that's exactly what it is. And I have to trust them on that. So, in this case, that would be baptism. The ceremonial washing would be a baptismal washing. Now, the second part that comes out in this verse is that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Okay, so it appeared not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now, what, now what is mercy? And, and what does that mean? It means it's a free gift. In other words, it's grace. And I thought I would spend a few minutes here going through the idea, uh, just, just reading the dictionary, because most of us have a good idea of what grace is. But I want to give a fuller explanation out of my 1828 dictionary, which should help us to understand what grace is all about. So bear with me a moment. First off, it's favor. And we would normally use it in this sense that it's unmerited favor. 
It's goodwill, it's kindness, disposition to oblige another as a grant made as an act of grace. Secondly, appropriately, the free, unmerited love and favor of God, the spring and source of all benefits men receive from Him. So now, now, now what the dictionary is defining is that grace is the way, it, it's the favor, the unmerited favor. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Okay, so while we were yet sinners, God gave Jesus Christ to us. In other words, this is what grace is all about. The, he gave us a Savior when we were yet dead in our sins and trespasses. So, it, grace is the spring and source of all the benefits man receives from God. In other words, the only way you receive anything is by the great, from God is by the grace of God. So it's grace. Every single good thing that he gives is grace. I mean, favorable influence, divine influence, or the influence of the Spirit in renewing the heart and restraining from sin. So now he's moving it slightly to a different angle where even the good that we do after salvation is by the grace of God. And then finally, the application of Christ's righteousness to the sinner. Here we have God applying Christ's righteousness, righteousness to us, giving us the righteousness of Christ, again, even though we are sinners that deserve damnation and hell. Instead, he's given us eternal life. So in that, in that particular instance, I'm going to go to Romans chapter 6, uh, the last verse, because I think that helps us to understand a little bit more what I'm talking about on this. And then I've got some other verses that should help us to understand this also a little more, but I want to cover this grace because I want you to understand that baptism is nothing but grace. So, 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That, again, sheer grace. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The, what we've earned is death. We deserve damnation and hell because of our sin and trespasses. And he's given us instead eternal life. So also, I'd like to go to Romans 11, 5 through 6, and then I'll, I'll cover, cover a couple of more, and then, and, then, uh, and then I'll tie this to baptism more clearly. That's my hope. So 11, Romans 11, 5 and 6. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So the point... Paul is trying to tell us here is that there is a way to be saved. And it's only by grace. It cannot be by works. Otherwise, works is no more work. But it's by this free gift we have from God, we can receive salvation. Also now 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 10. Second Corinthians 12, oh, I'm sorry, 7 through 10. And here we have Paul who was, who was tempted. He had a thorn in his side, but we'll, we'll read this. 
And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. And so Paul is here clearly telling us, the moment he looks at himself, he wants to be strong in himself, he doesn't want to be buffeted. He doesn't want to be dealing with these battles. But when he does find that he is buffeted constantly by Satan, he has to depend on Jesus Christ. And in depending on him, he receives that grace that is offered. Now, also Romans 5, 19 through 21. And here again, we're, we're going to more clearly establish the fact that we're first sinners, saved by grace, undeserving. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that if as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. By the sin of Adam, every one of us were made sinners. Moreover, even more, the law entered that this offense might abound, that this sin and offense might abound or become more evident. So the law is showing us our sinfulness. And then he goes on, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. And so we see that God is offering his promises yet more where there's more sin. Not, of course, I'll read the first verse of chapter 6 also. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he's telling us that sin reigned and has reigned unto death. Again, if we go to the end of chapter 6 there, the 23rd verse, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then he says in the sixth, first verse, Two verses of chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? And so we see, even here, even, even with my old dictionary definition, we can't have uh, a desire to live in sin after new birth. Otherwise, the grace isn't doing what it's supposed to do. So it's by grace that we're saved, and it's by grace that we do the will of God. In other words, it's His gift in us that causes us to do His will. And now I could go here, again, I've gone there many times, but Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 24 through 28, very clearly establishes that. I don't know if we'll go there or not, but you could definitely read that on your own time. I may go there anyway because it does cover baptism again. Point being, I want to tie together grace and baptism perfectly. And, and now I'm going to do that. We're going to go to Mark 16, 15 and 16. So that's Mark, if I have it in my Bible here.
Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. If we understood grace here properly, we will see that this ties perfectly to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. which is always a go-to. It's a, it's a go-to verse because it covers perfectly the idea of, of how salvation is granted to us and uh, how we receive that. For by grace are ye saved through faith. This is not a contradictory verse, so I'm going to stay on these two verses for a moment here. Mark 16, 16, and Ephesians 2, 8, they, they, they do not contradict each other. They complement each other, and they overlay one another perfectly. We see in each verse we have grace through faith. Mark 16, we have believing, which is the faith aspect, and baptized, which is the grace aspect. In other words, God is giving his gifts to you through baptism. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. These verses, yes, they're worded slightly differently, but they mean exactly the same thing. And I hope we can understand that. We wouldn't want to negate the grace that is in baptism because it is a means of grace. It's an avenue by which God is offering his promises. Why do I say that? Let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, and we'll see how, how uh, Peter responds to the, to the Jews who had found themselves as the ones who killed Jesus Christ the Lord and wondered what they ought to do about it. Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and, and, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Peter is very clearly laying out in baptism we receive the name of a child of God we receive the remission of sins we receive the gift of the Holy Ghost and we receive the promise of eternal life where these promises are there is certainly salvation and when that's been granted unto you, that you've received these promises. Now, I understand that the reception is actually by faith, but they've been poured out upon you. And, and again, back to Acts 2.38, I'm sorry, to Ephesians 2.8. In, in here we see, by grace are ye saved. Okay, so it's completely external. God has done everything for salvation. He has saved us through Jesus Christ, his son. We receive that by faith. Now, you need to know that. How can you believe on something you haven't heard? Romans 10. You have to hear it. In baptism, you hear it. You hear that you have received the gift of the Holy Ghost, the name of a child of God, the forgiveness of sins. And the, and the promise of eternal life. You hear it. And we trust that you would believe it. Not all, all, not all will believe it, but that doesn't mean it hasn't been given. And so God's side of this is all totally taken care of. He has done what he said. He did save you. 
Some may not believe it. And that, hey, if they reject the promises of God, what are you to do about that? Nothing. Um, also, I'd like to show you Apostle Paul, just as an example here, Acts 22, 13 through 16. Acts 22, verses 13 through 16. And here we have Paul coming to, uh, to Ananias. Or, or vice versa, Ananias actually came to Paul, but in one way or another. And he came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, the God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Here we have Paul, Saul at the time. And Ananias tells him, Why, why, why are you waiting? Be baptized and wash away your sins. And so here we see, again, the forgiveness of sins is in here. And it's offered through baptism. Now, is this the only way? Well, I'm not negating that it's the word behind the baptism that is efficacious for salvation. But it's God's way of giving his word. And here in baptism, the beautiful part of baptism is we have a physical sign, the water, the, or a physical element. We have the water. We have a preacher, which many people are interested. Romans 10 covers this very well. Um, how can he hear without a preacher, right? What, is, what, what do we want this person to hear? We want them to hear about Jesus Christ. And so now we have a preacher. We also have the laying on of hands. All of these things come together in a manner that one cannot help but know that they have received the promises of God or the promises of God have at least been poured out on them. Now it's received by faith again. So I wanted to cover one last point. Um, what, how we exactly cover this, I don't know. But our sin debt has been paid by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. The promise of life through him is offered to us in baptism. And I hope we've understood here that baptism is nothing but grace. And that the promise of eternal life is offered <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to us in baptism by God himself. And I think this is maybe the one thing that scares people the most. Somehow they're thinking that they're doing something for God in baptism where the reality is that it is God is doing something for you in baptism. He's offering his promises. It is God who is baptizing you through a preacher. And that I hope we can understand. This is grace personified. It's made as clearly evident as possible where we have all the, the physical element the laying on of hands, and the promises given in a manner that you can't forget. That's my hope. Certainly, where forgiveness of sins is, the name of a child of God is given, <clears throat> the gift of the Holy Ghost, and the promise of eternal life is offered, there is salvation. And that was the point of this, this video. Is there salvation in baptism? Absolutely. Without a doubt. We receive it by faith. Yes. But we're talking about grace. How are you saved? Saving and salvation, that's the point here. How are we saved? It's by grace. It's received by faith. But I think we, may, I think we mix these up occasionally, where we start to think that we're saved by faith. No, we're saved by grace. We receive it by faith. And this is a distinction that should be understood. So, receive it by faith. Believe these promises offered. 
Be comforted by it. Continue believing that the grace of God is sufficient for your salvation. God bless you all, and see you next time.